Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 880. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is September 17th, 2024. All right, welcome to another wonderful, amazing episode of Anglican Unscripted. We're glad you could be here. Before we get too far into the program, this is where you find that little like button. You click it. If you have not done so, you go to the comments section and give us your opinion and tell us any story ideas you have. If you've not subscribed yet, what an opportunity. I can't think of a better opportunity than right now to click that red rectangle, hit the bell as it pops up, and subscribe to this program. And please share this episode with family, friends, and foe because you love them. You do. George, how are you doing this week? I got to say the uh, spiritual temperature is rising, rising, rising. Uh, um, in my parish, I swear I noticed it, but also in the country as the whole. I've had uh, three, three men, older men, come to me over the past few days telling me about the, their had conversion experiences they get it you know lifelong episcopalians have gone to church with their wives and all of a sudden after 40 50 years they Um, understand yeah and at the same time there have been attacks and deaths and you know i have a a godchild who is a convict and she's had to go into administrative segregation because some uh, girls on her pod at the prison uh, take offense to her preaching the good news of Jesus Christ and to threaten to kill her. So she's had to be moved uh, into isolation, solitary, for her own protection. So I've got a letter off to the warden asking her to be moved to another prison, but the number of growth things is rising, while at the same time the number of attacks and brokenness is, is rising as well. It, we're not, the doldrums of the summer are over. Uh, it's, and I look at our country, and my goodness, the temperatures, it, we're mm. boiling right now. We're well, boiling. in the whole, in the whole world, it's a mad, mad, mad world out there. When, if you go on the internet, you go on X or Facebook or any news site whatsoever, you, you you're just pummeled with stuff that doesn't make any sense to you. A, a mm-hmm. President Trump had another assassination attempt and it's his fault. Uh, uh, you know, it's just okay. <laughs> I mean, he, this is, it's, I mean, uh, Orwellian, uh, to, to the 10th degree is what's, what's happening. And, uh, my brain just can't comprehend reading some of these stories, uh, about what's going on in the world. And I, I sit back and I go, you know, uh, how do kids take on the news? How do they adjust? Do they even hear news anymore? Um, or do they just hear platitudes and, and cliches, and uh, that's as far as they get. I, I just don't understand anymore, George. Uh, therefore, when I sit back and, and know that uh, I have a faith system, that I'm a Christian, that uh, my belief is in Scripture and uh, uh, the kingdom, I, I feel good about that, but I worry for all those who are outside. You know? So, uh, let's move on to some news. Oh, boy. And it's not just us. It's everywhere. It's America. (laughs) It's the world. It is. Uh, Yeah, and we saw the last couple months in uh, Britain. People were arrested Mm -hmm. just for something that we have uh, right here in America, freedom of speech, to to post stuff that would offend people. I I can offend somebody on Facebook. I'm not going to jail. I may get a, uh, a, a, a visit from the FBI, but I could tell them off on my front porch. You know, so oh, there's a story out of England that's not Anglican related, but just yeah. a a prominent BBC personality was yeah. uh, tried and convicted of child pornography charges and given a six month suspended sentence, no custodial time, and then then the little old ladies uh, getting three years for posting uh, mean tweets. Yeah. Uh, you you can get involved in the most vile pedophilia. Or as you pointed out, be you know, be a rapist and serve less jail time, if any jail time, yeah. for somebody who says something the government doesn't like. Airstrip one. Oh boy. All right, let's move on to the news, George. Story one you sent me. 
tech leaders come out against Trump, and I'm not surprised by this, the, whether it be the Bishop of Southeast Florida, Bishop of Texas, the ENS. Uh, for me, uh, nobody likes Trump. Okay, Trump is the enemy uh, of all. Hillary Clinton was on MSNBC last night saying that we have to be able to arrest those people who put disinformation on the internet. We need a deterrent. Okay, and as far as she's concerned, Trump is evil. And I may, and she didn't say this, but she would be proud of the next person who, who actually comes out and assassinates Trump. That would be a hero to the Democrats. Mm -hmm. So I'm not surprised when we have opinions from bishops in the Episcopal Church, however they may be. Yeah, at, at, I mean, uh, these are uh, not leading intellectual lights. Uh, the Bishop of Texas is important because Texas is the biggest diocese. Yeah, sure. He's a, he's a functionary. I've never had high regard for him as, a, as an original thinker. But he had, a, he had uh, one of our viewers set us some uh, Twitter comments he made where he basically denounced the opponents of illegal immigration as being neo-nazis white supremacists and so on and so forth meanwhile the bishop of southeast florida said we have a lot of haitians in miami and we have two haitian oriented congregations and haitians are nice people and anybody who says haitians are bad people are doing bad things is racist neo-nazi fascist all this and that well you know Tell that to the people who are going to the town council meetings at, in Springfield, Ohio, and other places where when the government dumps 15,000 or so Haitian immigrants into a town of 40, 50,000 people and things fall apart, tell those people. And ENS, after the Trump assassination report, has an article whose headline reads, after Trump Vance creates stories demonizing migrants, Ohio City feels brunt of bigotry, threats of violence. So Trump and Vance are responsible for the unrest caused by illegal Im immigrants, the un by uh, the government shipping tens of thousands of people to little Midwestern towns um, you know, th that just s overwhelm social services, overwhelm schools, over you know drive up the cost of housing, um, in my congregation, I have several, several unskilled men. Um, you know, one guy's about my age, and he's basically, you know, he, he cuts grass when he can. He does these odd jobs here and there. He's unable to find a steady job because local contractors can hire an illegal for less than minimum wage, driving him basically out of the wage market. And the cost of housing is rising. Uh, so, I mean, I, I see the effects in poor whites in my area uh, being uh, driven out of the work labor force. Yeah. Well, let's take a, a step back and we're talking about immigration versus illegal immigration. Uh, America has been a proud country of having immigration since day one. Uh, Okay, the, the uh, Native Americans probably weren't in favor of it, but uh, since day one, immigrants have been coming to this country, um, and it, it is the DNA and census of who we are. We're a nation of immigrants. And nobody here on this program is saying we can't have millions more immigrants. What we are talking about here is illegal, uncontrolled immigration where we have just traffickers, making a lot of money, uh, bringing people here to uh, the southern border, and uh, it, it's become a criminal enterprise. Now, we, they come here illegally, and we don't have the resources to handle this. Ask anybody in New York City. It's been decimated now by uh, a horrible uh, uh, prosecutor who won't prosecute uh, shoplifting. It's been decimated by uh, the inability to house 200,000 uh, illegal immigrants. Ronald Reagan and I support immigration. He said there's not enough immigrants in this country. We should have more immigration in the country all the time. But it must be done through a process. It can't be done through an illegal means. 
It's not helpful to the immigrants, and it's not helpful to our society and how we deal with it. And there's nothing wrong with putting your hands up and saying, it's not working. And here's the evidence we, that it's not working. You know? The legal process is a pretty good one. You require a sponsor. You have to have mm -hmm. a job. You have to have you know, some knowledge of it. In other words, there's, there's a real process you go through so that the best and brightest and people who add to the country come in. We don't have a need for mass unskilled labor. Um, go, you know, you go to the new, go to the Tesla factories that they've that's built in uh, Texas. You know, a hundred years ago in Detroit, you would have thousands of guys doing unskilled labor or up to semi-skilled labor. The, the future of factories and heavy industry are robotics, and you need lots of engineers and lots of skilled machinists and. These are not the people crossing the border illegally. Um, these are the people trying to come through the, the, the system legally, but it takes them all these years. Mm -hmm. And there's just a terrible mismatch uh, between well, what well, the that, country needs and what it's getting. And it needs what to get, but there's also a mismatch in cost. When you bring a immigrant uh, by bus to New York City and you house them, the contract to house one immigrant is three hundred and forty-eight dollars a day, in, in their, uh, and that's what? <laughs> that's a lot of money. And uh, so, if it's three forty a day in uh, New York City, what is it in Ohio? You know, we, we we're asking our cities to uh, make shelters and make way uh, for these illegal immigrants now. I don't think there's enough legal immigration. I would, you know, right now it's like you, you can bring in 200,000 or 150,000 uh, immigrants are allowed in America a year. I would raise that to a million. I have no trouble with that because you bring in the skilled, you bring in uh, those who can be productive and uh, uh, assimilate to the American society. Here, no, no such thing. So do I find it problematic that bishops in the Episcopal Church are um, complaining about Trump and uh, Im Ill illegal immigration? No, because they have no voice anymore. 20 years ago, it would have meant something if they said something. Not anymore. Yeah, they're, they're a spent force. They really do not have uh, any... Uh, they don't have moral authority. They certainly have no political authority. Yeah. Nor does Pope Francis. Okay, this is the, the, the time in the show where all the Roman Catholics who watch us are, are tuned in. And what are Kevin and George going to talk about when it comes to Pope Francis? Pope Francis has weighed in on the U.S. election that's coming up here November 5th between Harris and Trump. Should be interesting. He's also weighed in on where all religions lead to. And I thought this would be interesting. You wrote down the quote. I'll let you read it. Francis uh, had a trip through Southeast Asia, and mm -hmm. he ended the tour in Singapore. And at a public meeting, uh, he told, uh, he had an off-the-cuff comment, and I'll read the quote because it is important. Mm -hmm. Religions are like different languages in order to arrive at God. But God is God for all. Since God is God for all, then we are all children of God. This is universalism. This is many rivers lead to the sea. Uh, you can be a good, you can worship Allah, you can worship Vishnu, you can worship a thousand, a million Hindu deities. Buddha. And you, you will arrive at mm -hmm. the God the Father. Now this caused an instant furore uh, on Catholic. First off, it had, it had really no comment whatsoever in the secular press because it's perfectly in line with the they secular like ideology. Huh? Yeah, I mean, that's what they think. But in the religious press, Catholic bloggers, you know, broke out in hysterics, rightly so, because the Pope was contradicting the catechism of the Catholic Church, contradicting uh, his most recent encyclicals on this subject. And, you know, there's this fellow named Jesus Christ that uh, the only way to the Father is through the Son. Uh, uh -huh. Not all rovers lead to the sea. Uh, only Jesus Christ leads to the Father. Well, in, and, in Acts 4, it says, uh, uh, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no, no other, other name, name under heaven. Yeah. So the 
But this time, you know, the Mary thing where Francis uh, did a little sidestep and push and marry our sister as opposed to marry the, our mother, that caused a ruckus in the blogosphere. But this time around, we're seeing like Archbishop Chaput, Chaput, I think he's the Archbishop of Philadelphia, senior Catholic leaders saying, no, Francis is mistaken when he says this. And this is not Francis's defenders, you know, Father James Martin at America Magazine are saying, well, what he means is that God loves us all and this and that and the other. But the, the point is Francis needs to be precise in his language. Kevin, you mentioned that if Francis had said you know, the only way to the Father is through the Son, Jesus Christ, that would have been a wonderful thing to say in an interfaith gathering. And it would have got the press that he, yeah. Believe. Yeah, and it would have got na uh, national press around the world, you know, because mm -hmm. that's something they don't understand. What? what? And so we're in this, this little issue where you are given so few opportunities to witness to the salvation through Christ, especially as an archbishop or as a pope. And I can remember very distinctly uh, an interview with Justin Welby where he was asked this type of question and he failed miserably. I remember an interview with uh, Michael Curry where he was asked this type of question and failed miserably. And it hurts my heart to see Pope Francis in a situation where he cannot... Um, communicate the importance of Jesus in one's life and in the nature of the kingdom. What an opportunity you had. Yeah, Go I on. mean, Curry's, Curry's little line is that God is love and whatever love is, God is. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. Um, I love my dogs who are snoring in the background. Yeah, I, I hear guess them. God is present among us. When two or three are gathered together with my dogs, you know, he will be amongst yeah. them. I'm being silly, but, no. you know, Francis, uh, we joke that Francis is, is a secret Episcopalian. He's now a San Francisco Episcopalian. He's really moving to the left wing of the Episcopal Church theologically very, very quickly. Um, well, here, this is now, the who's naming all these new cardinals. So is yeah. there any hope for the Catholic Church in the future? And you and I have spoken frequently about uh, he, he being raised up uh, in name at the concert, at the installation of Bishop Archbishop Foley. Sorry, to, my coffee has not taken hold. Uh, Ten years ago, that uh, Archbishop Greg Venables got up and said, "Hey, listen, I've spoken to the Pope, and he wants to give us encouragement to what's happening here with the enthronement and institution of Archbishop Foley." Would we now seek the Pope's encouragement with the next Archbishop? Is it, do we want his voice? Um, I don't think so. I think he's just Well, if it pisses off Justin Welby, yes. Oh, uh, all but right. for theological, <laughs> moral reasons, no. <laughs> okay, yeah, I see that. All right. I get that. All right, next story. Um, it's, like having your, it's like having your ex-wife show up at your wedding. You know, just <laughs> it's not I, what you really want. No, no, no. All right. Uh, trouble in Sudan. The Archbishop of Sudan reports the cathedral in uh, Kotom has been wrecked by fighting. Um, it's really bad over there, George. Um, it's been a problem since the, uh, um, the separation of North and South, and it's over oil. Yeah, and there's been a, the two states, North Sudan and South Sudan, which fought mm -hmm. a 30 plus year civil war, s separation of the two countries. Mm -hmm. And since then, I think it's been going on three years now, maybe four, yeah, I can't, four. can't remember. Yeah. Sudan itself has been in the civil war between the army and the militia. And how does a dirt poor country like Sudan fund a civil war because bullets and weapons are expensive because the Chinese are funding one side and the Russians are finding the other and both sides buy arms on the European arms market. And what's the prize? Well, the oil in uh, along the coast in the south of Sudan itself. Now, what's happened is that the city of Khartoum has been almost just about wrecked. The cathedral has been shot up several times. The uh, uh, 
but the bishop did say that of our 30 congregations, 25 are still active. Now, what does that mean? They may not be in the building. They may, the building may have been burned down. It may be totally destroyed, but the ministers and the priests are working with the people to share the power of Christ's love in their life in the midst of famine and war. Um, now, the House of Lords had a recent debate on uh, the problem in Sudan, and Justin Welby, uh, his heart's in the right place, but he just has a poor way of expressing himself sometime, I believe. Because he, he said, we need to have joined up thinking about what to do in Sudan. And I have to tell you, Kevin, that phrase just 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 causes me to cringe. That's, the, long and the, short that's of it is, the evolution of Indaba. Yeah. Well, I think the sad thing is, it really doesn't matter what Britain does anymore. Mm. Okay? They're not going to be able to interfere with the Russians and the Chinese. They're more preoccupied with what's happening in the Ukraine and Gaza. And so platitudes about Sudan are essentially that, platitudes. Um, you know, our own American government is disinterested. Uh, you know, we don't particularly care and we don't particularly have a, a desire to intervene and get between the Russians and the Chinese. We'd rather have them use their proxies to fight these, this out, then step in and have the CIA put in a new regime. It's cynical, of course, but it's a difficult world in which we live. And when the church has wasted so much of its uh, moral capital on uh, mosquito LLF. nets yeah. and climate and LLF, mm -hmm. it can't be a voice for change. I, saw, I read a New York Times article a few years ago where uh, the church had oh, the church was partnering with NGOs to send mosquito nets to Africa. Well, what happened with these mosquito nets? The Africans didn't use them for mosquito nets. Some did. They used them for fishing. And what happened was that many of the fish stocks were wiped out because of these very fine nets used to, to keep out mosquitoes, took all the fish, including the minnows and the babies and whatnot. It's the law of unintended consequences. And we see it play out again and again and again with these, you know, Bill Gates sponsored half assed programs to change the world so that we're all uh, uh, world WEF uh, fanboys. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, so which dog behind you is snoring the loudest? That would be Tara. Okay. She's the one with the shortest snout. She needs a CPAP machine. You know, <laughs> it's. <laughs> pretty loud back there all right let's uh, move on we've talked about the uh uh fce fellowship of uh, oh, just yeah just sure. just mention south of the border 17 south sudanese clergy were arrested by one of the militia groups and tortured in one of the western states and 30 plus churches have been shut down in the western bar al ghazal state which is on the border of the central african republic yeah. sudan and south sudan are in a tough space, spot. Yeah. But the clergy and the churches are still there for the people. They're not running away and they're not trying to change the topic. They're not blaming the people for their problems. They're trying to bring Jesus Christ into a dark corner of the world in the situation. Keep them in your prayers. The FCC dispute has reached the secular papers. Probably started here. Uh, we we uh, responded to the firing of Brett Murphy, and we responded to uh, other FCE stories that have uh, occurred over the last uh, last five years, as they've occurred. And uh, now the the secular press in Europe is Europe in England has taken a notice of what's going on, George. Yeah, the Free Church of England story, the firing of Brett Murphy and uh, Emmanuel Church Morecambe hit the secular press this weekend in the Daily Mail and the Telegraph. And what was interesting was, uh, so it's going to get a bit of press and Christian concern, the Advo legal advocacy group uh, that is getting involved too in supporting uh, Brett Murphy and the congregation there. What's interesting is that the FCE, Bishop Fennec and his allies are now saying that Murphy was fired because he's a mean tweeter which is a bit ridiculous because Murphy left the Church of England uh, 
and ha went through several, went through two disciplinary trials for saying that uh, uh, women priests are priestesses and are witchcraft and all this and that. He's an opponent of women priests and very vocal about it and very colorful about it. And so the FCE knew this all about Murphy when they, they brought they him, him. War. Yeah. They He took a church of two people to 50 people. And now when he got very popular and very successful, Fennec did what he's done in the past and fired him. And now after the fact has come up with, oh, you're a mean tweeter. We already knew this. Um, we're getting dozens of emails and text messages and Facebook messages with the latest blow by blow situation. And it's difficult because some of the claims being put forward verge on criminal misconduct by people in the FCE central office, of which we we have no, we have to be careful. We, we can't can verify it. Is. Yeah, sure. We, have, we can say somebody's a stinker and shouldn't yeah. be a bishop. But to say that they are a thief or this or that or the other, that, that crosses a line. Yeah. We got to be careful. Well, we need but verifiable does, sources. Yeah. And, but one thing that has happened, uh, we were sort of pushing Ray Sutton. Uh, Ray, you need to do something. You're the head of the Reformed Episcopal Church. You're the gorilla in the room. You're the, uh, out, you're the partner of the FCE. You really need to say something. Well, the REC leadership has said nothing public, except the REC newsletter that came out announced the retirement of Bishop Fennec. Oh, go get and, out of town. <laughs> yes. And uh -huh. earlier, a few weeks ago, months ago, Fennec said, oh, I'm not going to retire. I'm, you know, still have much to do. And I think somebody put the strong arm on Bishop Fennec saying, get out, get out now. And we're going to announce that you're leaving. Uh, now, so. we have no proof that any phone calls are made. Let, let's be on, you know, let, let's be forthright. We have no, no. However, wow, that's kind of a coincidence. Wow. Don't you think? Wow. wow. Well, I mean, well. and, and it's not on the FCE website last time I looked, but uh, there you are. Uh, small world. It's, it's small world, and but the... Uh, their claims that the Charity Commission is looking at the handling of the Free Church of England's National uh, Central Trust. I think they did that in 2022. Maybe this is having them take a second look. It's a mess. And to be perfectly frank, this is the sort of thing that can kill the denomination because if the government decides that, hey, you're fiddling with the funds, they'll be bankrupted by having lawyers defend themselves and so when it's all done they may win they may lose but they'll have spent their substance in the courts so we're fennec may be getting out just in time and hopefully there's a change of leadership um that enables uh this denomination to recover it needs to recover or, because well does it kevin or has it reached its sell by point because we now have the amie uh, the Anglican True. Network yeah. in yeah. In, yeah. in Europe. There is, are safe harbors, yeah. Is the FCE necessary? Mm -hmm. Or is it, uh, it, or is, does it carry now such baggage with two bad bishops? Mm -hmm. um, I'm not saying bad morally, I'm just saying they've not done the job that bishops should. Okay. Well, you, you, uh, It's comparable. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Well, this is an ever-growing story, and we'll keep you posted as it happens. Uh, the Daily Mail has reported that the government, this is uh, the uh, government in the UK, will fast-track legislation in Parliament to allow assisted suicide in euthanasia. Now, backing up here, Sweden and Canada have been uh, uh, offing depressed people, mildly depressed people, for about seven years now. If you want to seek... Uh, a end of life solution because you're depressed and you're sick and tired of going to therapy and you don't want to take those pills anymore. The government has a program where you can, I think it's a 15 minute interview in Sweden and there's like, you have to have two therapy, so two sessions in Canada before they will off you on your behalf. 
Well, let's 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 uh, go take that to England, George. Yeah, I mean, and you're reading about in Canada. Uh, once the bureaucrats get involved, uh, this one person who was uh, physically disabled, he needed medical treatment, and the bureaucrats said, "Well, it'd be easier if you just killed yourself. If we we allowed you to be murdered, yeah, in euthanasia, it'd be cheaper, a lot cheaper." And what happens? What happens is the pressure is put on the disabled, uh, the elderly to be rid of uh you know this is straight out of what the nazis did you know the uh, euthanasia program of the disabled the elderly the mentally handicapped to make to improve the blood stock and to remove the costs of caring for people in institutions um we we are now back at that spot and the what we've saw in seen in sweden and the netherlands canada has been that uh, evil has really uh, is driving this. Now, the Church of England has been against this in a sort of wishy-washy way. It's not helped our side, the evangelical <laughs> side, is not helped by George Carey uh, no. being uh. a champion for euthanasia. I think he's mistaken. Mm -hmm. I know he's a good man. Um, but I think this is a mistake he's made. And I have to say, if the government only has limited time in Parliament to do stuff, why why pick this stick up and bang it against a drum when there's so much other things they need to do? Yeah, reform their economy, speech laws. Military. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we'll, we'll, if Parliament does fast track this legislation we'll start seeing the various christian advocacy groups uh, speaking out we'll see this debated in church and but if the labor party wants it they've got such a majority that they'll have it the only way to block it is through a uh, a badly drafted legislation that fails legal judicial review or well let me put it this way there was a major contentious issue for those who don't follow british politics there was a major issue where the uh, winter heating allowance for pensioners was eliminated, 300 pounds a year. And this will cause people with, who are on a 12,000 pound a year pension basically to go without uh, food or heat, or it's gonna put some people in a difficult place where they have to make choices of, do I heat the house or do I eat today? Um, and labor, party before the election had said how terrible the Tories were for wanting to do this. Well, they switched sides and the Labour Party had a whip and said, you must vote for this. And it passed overwhelmingly, even though a lot of the Labour MPs had to hold their nose. So even if they are morally opposed to euthanasia, party discipline means this will pass. So, difficult times for Christians and their allies in the political world in England. Indeed. All right. Next story. The um, Church of England House of Bishops to discuss a paper at their meeting this week urging a change to the electoral process for bishops. I don't know what the problem is. This is working really well so far, George. Why do they need to change how it's working? <laughs> well, you could say it hasn't been working for 25, 30 years. I don't know. It hasn't been... It, you know, Gordon Brown gave up the government's basic right to select mm -hmm. a bishop. And uh, yeah. Gordon Brown was prime minister about 20 odd years ago. And that was a major mistake because it re removed a check against the bureaucratic central blob that controls the Church of England. And the net result has been over the years, we have seen uh, fads take over where, you know, we don't have bishops with pastoral experience. We have women appointed to be bishops just because they're women, not because of merit. There are some women who are very uh, meritorious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There is a meritocracy, but not all of the women who've been appointed bishops can make this claim that they were appointed or, for their skills or abilities, or were they appointed for their gender? The uh, same with some and, of those men who've been appointed as well. That's the, it's not just gender yeah, specific. You know, <laughs> there, and you know, we need to have yeah. more bishops of color. We need to have this, that, and the other, and. The la and what's happened though is that, so you've got a pretty mediocre bench of bishops right now. And 
the latest uh, thing is that we've had a failure of the process to elect bishops in Ely and Carlisle. We do not know the exact details because these processes are confidential, but the complaints coming out are that the LLF process has so split the church that you can the people cannot agree uh, one way or the other. So conservatives are vetoing liberals and liberals are vetoing conservatives. Well, the House of Bishops is to going to discuss a paper that gives takes away the, some of the powers of the committee and gives those powers to the central bureaucracy. So that the block, in other ways, to force the election of people, even if they are blocked for being liberal or conservative by either side. So what does this mean? This means that any check that, you know, the check by the government and the popular will on the House of Bishops composition was jettisoned. Now the check by the balance of powers within the Church of England is going to be jettisoned, giving the Archbishop of Canterbury double votes in certain circumstances and removing the requirement for a certain two-thirds supermajority down to a lower majority. Um, it's just, uh, it is a red flashing light saying this is a failed institution whose processes are not fit for the purposes that they are necessary, the design for. And it's only going to get worse. No, it's a good example of DEI uh, consecrations here. And, you know, it, it's hard to watch such, you know, the mothership do this, but. Yeah, you know, they're a great example. You know, people ask me, Kevin, what do you think about women's ordination? I, I said, listen, uh, first of all, I work with what I got, um, and I, I, I don't take too much sides on that. Well, would you recommend that for uh, our province? I said, based on just the history of the Mother Church, the Church of England, I would not recommend it because of how they did it. Um, and uh, they they would be a great example of how women's orders in the episcopacy has just devastated a church you, you, you can't you can't argue any other way observationally now the, you know there's the whole realm of women's orders beyond below that but you know that's just that's where i say it george i'm in trouble again oh boy all right let's move on to some other stories <laughs> yeah yeah yep. I, I get in even more trouble by saying Episcopacy is a necessary evil. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, it's just, uh, you know, yeah. I'm having the bishop visit in November. Um, my interactions with the bishop are recently I asked him permission to open a chaplaincy at the local prison. Mm -hmm. His assistant wrote back saying yes. Good. I get a, I've been at rector here. I'm entering my 11th year and I'm going to have my third Episcopal visitation in November. Yeah. What what am I getting, you know, for the 10 or 12 percent that we're kicking down to Orlando? Somebody showing up every three years, uh, four uh, years. Yeah. And uh, and basically, you know, I asked permission uh, to start a chaplaincy uh, just so that once I got it going, I wouldn't be say, oh, well, I'm sorry. It's in the geographic boundaries of another parish. You can't do that without permission of that guy. I didn't want to have to go through that crap. So you wanted I to play by the rules. There's nothing wrong with trying to play by the rules. Uh, we get that. All right. And now I have, yeah. but now I also, I also have to ask him: Can I use grape juice instead of wine? Because you know Ooh. you can't bring alcohol into a high security prison. Uh -huh. uh, you can get it. They make Pruno, but I'm not going to break. You know, Christ's blood was not Pruno, which was fermented uh, fruit juice uh, made out of fig newtons and stuff. Archbishop of the ACNA Woods has announced the Court of Inquiry is now ready to proceed against Bishop Ruck. It has been delayed uh, for various reasons, but one is they just don't have enough uh, people to uh, transact two court cases at once. Um, now, this has been a complaint of the Me Too or ACNA Too movement within uh, the ACNA. Why does it take so long to have justice? justice against uh, Stuart Ruck and his cronies. And uh, I'm like, what? Cronies? Stuart Ruck? He's a nice guy. Now we know. It's just, you know, we don't have enough, we don't have the personnel uh, to conduct two, three, four trials at once, George. 
Yeah, they had to finish the Todd Atkinson trial. Atkinson was the bishop up in Canada uh, who was brought on board the Anglican Network in Canada. And there were soon complaints about him being a a spiritual bully, uh, misconduct, personal misconduct. And it had to work its way through the system. And so we've had all, and he's now out. Yes. Uh, Todd Atkinson's out. Uh, he used to be the tallest Acna bishop. No, no longer. I don't know who no, is. Now. We need more tall bishops, but I get it. Yeah. But because they only had one court, one prosecutor, one this and that, you can't run two of these things simultaneously. There's just not the money or the time. So now that the Atkinson, and frankly, the Atkinson uh, accusations were more serious than anything that's been leveled against Ruck that I've seen. I've not seen everything, but well, there it is. So now Bishop Woods announced in a pastoral letter to the province that after the recent uh, assembly meeting in Latrobe, Pennsylvania, the, uh, oh, I've got a little thing to add about that assembly okay. thing, but um, they have, uh, he has affirmed the appointment of a church prosecutor, uh, church uh, uh, canon law advisor, a court the new court for the trial of a bishop has been approved and appointed. So all the pieces are in place for the Ruck proceedings to go ahead. Um, I, like you, like as a person, Stuart mm-hmm. Ruck. And I don't wish to make excuses for him, but I just see no evil in this guy. Um, but Well, that's again, not what he's accused of. He's accused of some type of mismanagement or not following through on... on uh, whatever. Uh, and, you know... At what point, Kevin, does misman... I mean, there's mismanagement yeah. and then there's malice. Yeah. Um, at what point do we say, oh, you screwed up, don't do it again, versus you're a bad person who shouldn't be in this job? Yeah. Well, having served on two jur- Yeah, having served on two juries in Connecticut... Um, they don't. They, they don't care about the mal. Uh, the, that divide. They care about was somebody injured, and if somebody was injured, that's where you make your decision on guilt. And uh, um, I don't know. We'll, we'll have to see how this works out and plays out. I hopefully they are uh, open and you know, give us some press releases so we can talk about it. Uh, at least when it's over, that could be kind of cool. Um, let's move on to I, I our to, yeah. I, oh I, yeah, I do Latrobe. Want to before we move past the yeah. Latrobe. Uh, there's some Catholic bloggers out there who really have a bee in their bonnet about Anglicans and about women priests. Okay. And the uh, some films were released of uh, women acne priests celebrating at the uh, altar at, at the chapel at uh, uh, St. Vincent's College. Yes, yep, St. Vincent's in Ca- Latrobe. Cathedral. Yeah, yeah. That's a Benedict- Benedictine, I think it's Benedictine College. Mm-hmm. And so in the Catholic blockosphere and the traditional side, oh, we need to reconsecrate the altar, the altar, do a massive <laughs> reparation uh-huh. for the horrendous crime of having witches and priestesses celebrate at the altar. Uh, you know, the abbot must be removed, the place bulldozed and burned to the ground and never let those heretical schismatic Anglicans on site again. Well, Bob Duncan and the abbot of... Uh, the uh, the president of St. Vincent's College, who I think is an abbot, Benedictine abbot, yeah. were longtime friends. And he inv- the abbot invited Bob way back when to hold their things there. Sure. And it, it, it gives money to the, I mean, it it's a source of income for Latrobe, and it's also a sign of ecumenical friendship. But there are still people who have a hissy fit um, you know, we have to burn all the linens, you know, because a, a woman priest was up there. Now, this is not my issue. I don't get that worked up about it. Because, um, yeah, I the, mean, the, if Mother Mary or Sister Mary, whoever she is nowadays, was behind the altar serving Eucharist, I don't think they'd say a word. So, yeah. Just so, my, so uh, uh-huh. if, if you're a Catholic blogger, Mm. Let's fight about Mary. Let's yeah. fight about Francis <laughs> being an Episcopalian. Mm-hmm. 
let's just not worry about uh, what happens at Catholic uh, ab uh, churches when they rent out the building. Cool. Hey, last story here. Unless we have time to talk about something stupid. Let's talk about the Diocese of London has advertised a new post for the head of racial justice priority to foster a culture that is built on love, fairness, equity, justice, collaboration, and integrity. All those wonderful things found in scripture, George. Oh boy. And this yeah. and this new head of racial justice priority. What a strange title. His job, her job, job, their job. Their job. The there. Is to break down mental, cultural, and institutional barriers that exist within the diocesan structures, policies, and processes to engender true race equality. At 66,666 pounds. pounds a year. <laughs> yeah. So they need, they want to have a DEI officer in the Diocese of London who gets paid two to three times a priest or a curate to push uh, race equality. Well, now, the, 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 let me be honest here. The Diocese of London deserves this. This is karma. You know, this is, you know, the, for what they've been doing for years, good. Hire this person and give them a raise right away. And uh, when they say you have too many white people, fire them. You know, when they say you don't have enough uh, women, hire them. Yeah, you know, just do whatever they say, because I don't see how the Diocese of London is e even recoverable at this stage anyway. So, go, have well, it. You know, maybe maybe Calvin Robinson wants to go back to the UK, leave Michigan. Yeah. Uh, he is, a, a call, you know, biracial, of course, and yeah. he can engender true racial equality by yeah. proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. <laughs> I know. And the Christ is <laughs> a slave to free Greek to Jew, male nor female. Yeah. He would of do it right. They're not going to hire. Their, he would do it right, and he'd be excellent. Yeah. yeah. But they're not going to hire somebody like that. They're going to hire a DEI activist. Uh, you know, now the corporations are shut. You know, the church is always behind the eight curve. Corporations are shutting and shutting down their DEI offices uh, because they realize it's a waste of time. Now, Walt Disney never will, but a lot of other companies are starting to say, "Hey, this is not returning money on the bottom line. In fact, it's making things worse." Yeah. Asked Boeing, uh, but Marcus Walker, who is a rector of uh, Great Saint Bartholomew in London and a uh, sure. prolific blogger, yeah, yeah, put, I've been you know, put out a picture of the ad, put out a picture of the ad in the, I think it was the Church Times, and had a little note saying that according to the financial summary of 2023, the London Diocesan Fund is reporting an operating def deficit of 6.7 million pounds. For transfers and gain so 6.7 million dollar operating loss but they got 66,640 50 60 pounds to throw away on a DEI officer no that's not throwing away George they deserve this they do I, I'm looking forward to you know who whomever now it wouldn't be a whom for sure it'd be a they or us Whatever pronoun that you go by, I'm looking forward to to announcing that here on Anglican Unscripted for our viewers. Okay, George, have we talked about politics yet? We're good. Not really. No, we've uh -huh. we've uh, we talked about exhaustion from politics. Yes. Mad, and mad, we mad world. About, oh. And we talked about I'll call it brainwashing. Um, I, you know, the Bishop of Texas may not be the brightest, uh, sharpest knife in the drawer, but he's a decent man. But the thing is, he only associates with people, and he only reads news. If all you do is read MSNBC, watch MSNBC and CNN, and read The Atlantic, and likewise publications, and have a closed circle of friends, of course you're going to think Donald Trump's a neo-Nazi. Of course you're going to think he's a white supremacist. Of course you're going to think the white working class are all monsters. But if you're a bishop, you should keep your mouth shut. I don't know. You're going to have white people in your <laughs> congregations. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's very difficult for a clergy person or a uh, Episcopal person to come down on politics. Uh, you don't see that at all within the ACNA. Seldom do does an ACNA bishop uh, post their political uh, leanings, or um, which I think is wise, um, because we you represent you, you you represent people on both sides of the aisle. 
and when we did have it, it was C4SO types, but yeah. they weren't bishop. It was, was yeah. it was you know. It was expected trade. too. It was expected. Of course, they would say that. Yeah. Now, uh, I is is Donald Trump a neo-Nazi? No. Does he lack decorum? Yeah. I, okay. All right. I, I'll, I'll let you get away with that. But um, I. I don't want the press to be the people who identify and tell me who to like or believe in. I want them to tell me both sides of a story. Now, George and I are pundits. We, uh, uh, in the Anglican sphere, we do have a bias. We have a God bias. I believe in God. I believe in the Nicene creeds. I believe in all these uh, creeds. And uh, I believe in Jesus. I, I get it, and for some people, that's just too much. Kevin, you 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 believe in unicorns too, so I, I get that I have a bias. We do try to present both sides of stories here. We don't do really well at it because we have a bias, a God bias, and with a God bias comes a good and bad bias, or a good and evil bias. Um, I don't see Donald Trump as being evil like. 90% of the news media here in America do. Okay, I think he lacks decorum. I don't think Camp Kamala Cam Miss Harris, Mrs. Harris has evil in her ed as well. She I, I don't think she has anything in her uh, between her ears, but uh, I in so in as such I don't see evil in her and so um that, that's a bias I have. How do we play politics in 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 the Christian sphere then, George? Because uh, the Pope has taken sides. Well, I think we. I'll speak what I think. I yeah. you know, I'm a pragmatist. I have sure. my personal views, um, and but I have to live a life where my whole being and purpose is to share the good news of Jesus Christ. So I have people who are active on both sides of the political aisle within the congregation and so i do not preach about donald trump or kamala harris kamala harris kamala or whatever i keep getting corrected um, uh, instead we might have bible studies where we look at uh, things that are in the news and we try to bring around both sides i'll give you an example of what pragmatism and you may think that i'm just an empty suit when i say this i'm an evangelical in temperament and theology in working with the chaplain at the prison, the prison has nobody who does liturgical church services. They're overrun with Baptists, Pentecostal. Yeah. It is the deep south. And so he wanted somebody to come and do a bells and smells service, but I'm not allowed to use bells and I can't use smells. <laughs> he wanted a high liturgical service in the church, in the chapel, so that men who seek very strong structure through the prayer book can worship and then I can give my evangelical sermon. Well, George, you're a hypocrite because you'll be getting, you'll be all gussied up to the nines and you'll be, you know, doing things that within the church's civil wars over liturgy and having candles on the altar and everything, you're betraying your team's beliefs. I look at it this way I need to bring Jesus Christ. And if these fellas are brought through high sacraments, then I'm doing my job. Um, and I need to keep my mouth shut um, about things that can divide, only see and just preach Christ and him crucified, and that's all. No, and pragmatism. Yeah. Pragmatism, what are the practical effects of what I'm doing? You yeah. know, and, and certainly in, in a liturgical environment, that's a, that's understandable. Uh, you know, for me, I'm a big picture person. Uh, I survived Obama. I could probably survive Kamala. Um, I survived Trump and made a lot of money. Trump was very generous to the way that I invest money. I don't think he knew that. Um, but uh, Trump uh, quadrupled my wealth. All right, you know, that's you know, my, my retirement is is well stocked because I invested in what were called Trump stocks at the time. Uh, I have never voted for Trump, as you and I have discussed in the past. However, when you put forth an individual as 
in my humble opinion, is hollow as Kamala, uh, I probably would be leaning towards voting for Trump because I witnessed his four years, and except for the, uh, that January thing, uh, I had no trouble with his four years. He was not evil. So I don't know. We'll, we'll have to see what happens. It, it is interesting, though. I mean, but I mean, politics was always interesting. Way from row on, yeah. Well, you know, it takes us back to what Francis said that uh, um, we sometimes, you know, Francis basically did a plague on both your houses. They're both anti-life. One is anti, anti-immigration, while he, Trump is really anti-illegal immigration, yeah. and Harris is pro-abortion. I think we, I think Francis's failure was to discern between, you know what is a political disagreement versus a moral disagreement? Abortion, I believe, is morally indefensible. I mean, there are instances when the life of the mother, you know, you have to make hard choices, but I don't think that abortion up to the time of birth is a cho- is something that a Christian, as I understand it, can support. Whereas seeking to uphold the laws of a country as they apply to illegal immigration i don't think that's anti-christian yeah you need to use your discernment to find you know what the moral right choice is yeah. now it's easy e- easy for me in this county 90 percent of the people will vote the same way i am hint hint florida <laughs> yeah. rural florida yeah okay you, you you don't need to know anything more than that but uh yeah, I, they should. I don't even know what the open polls down there. We know who's going to win in Florida. Um, the last close election you had was probably DeSantos and his. Uh, he was running against I forget his name. Um, you, you, there are not many close elections in Florida, but the the governor of the last Santos, close la- 2020, uh, 2000 was the last close one with the hanging chads. Yeah, and Al Gore. Al Gore and uh, George uh, W. Bush. Mm-hmm. But since then. Uh, the state has moved, has changed very much. Yeah, it has. It's, I mean, it's no longer, we used to, this part of Florida in 2020 would have gone completely for Al, 2000 would have gone for all for Al Gore because of being yellow dog Southern Democrats. Yeah. Those people have died and all these people have moved here from New Jersey or, or the farmers have switched their votes Republican from Democrat. Or, or the pendulum. I mean, the reality, the best thing that has happened in the last you know, 20, 30 years of presidential elections is Hillary lost. She was a, she's a demagogue, you know, of demagogues. And uh, she is the bullet we missed, uh, dodged that bullet. Um, and you, you see her now doing interviews and she's just, whew, that would have been so bad. Now, so was Al Gore. Al Gore was uh, a bullet we dodged. So we'll see. I think Al Gore went, I think he went crazy after the election. Yeah, he did. I, Al, Gore I get that. Always, Al Gore was always a bit of a centrist and conservative, but mm-hmm. something snapped in him after 2020, after 2000. He divorced his wife. Yep. He went all out on her on her crazy. deathbed. Yeah, I yeah. mean, just something happened with that election to him psychologically. I don't know, yeah. but I but you know, I don't think the country would have been worse off with Al Gore if he continued the Bill Clinton policies that he was championing. Sure. But he just then went crazy in his post-election life. Yeah. I, trivia for you. Bill Clinton was the last president to uh, to reverse the deficit in his last uh, two years in office. President Ford was the only other presidential person to have two attempts on his life. Mm. 17 days apart. Just weird trivia we have here in America, I'll tell you that. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 880 of Anglican Unscripted. (laughs) 